meditation. What did you just think of when I said that word, meditation? What did you conjure up? Did it trigger you? Or did you say, wow, meditation, it's something I do. Well, there are other words for meditation called mindfulness or centering prayer even, or just sitting still and quieting your mind. But somehow the word meditation can trigger us. But did you know that it has scientifically proven physiological benefits? And here to explore those benefits, to talk about what is mindfulness meditation in the first place, how do you do it and how it benefits you? Here again is Dr. Elizabeth LaFay from Elite Healthcare. So Dr. LaFay, when you talk to your patients, what do you tell them about meditation? If you tell them about meditation? Yeah. Um, you know, you have to kind of read the room a little bit <laughs> for sure. Um, but even just listening to you there in that intro, uh, you know, it's funny. I used to hear the word meditation and think of, you know, like sitting cross-legged in a corner and oming. And so that's sort of the joke that I make with patients routinely because it's, it's easy. I think sometimes to forget how far you've evolved as an individual in order to be relatable to a person or a patient that you're trying to, you know, help, um, with their, with their health in my case. So, <clears throat> So I often will bring it up in a gentler way, not using the word meditation intentionally because it does, it does trigger. Um, I've noticed hearing it now, um, you know, after having a practice of meditation, my own self for a number of years now that it, it, it makes me feel totally different hearing it. And um, I think that's interesting to, to think about. Um, but I do make a little joke. I make a joke about how, how it makes us feel and, and maybe the images that they might be having in it. And then that's kind of my, my bridge into the conversation, um, which is interesting. You know, I really have only been bringing it up, uh, spirituality, prayer, meditation, the, that topic in general for about the last year. Um, even though I do believe it's as integral to someone's health as gut health, <laughs> which, you know, I think is really, um, a, just the root of things. Yes. So. so when we think of meditation, when I, I used to think of meditation, so I'll start with myself 20 years ago or so, I thought that it was really mostly associated with the Eastern religions, Buddhist monks somewhere out in Nepal and really something that those that subscribe to the Christian faith or the Catholic tradition denomination of the, the Christian faith, it, it, I, I somehow thought it was uh, running counter to my faith. And I learned over the years that it wasn't for me. And so while this isn't a philosophical, theological discussion, there still are many that believe that this Concept, concept of meditation is somehow anti-spiritual or against their religion, which I find very interesting because the way I have processed it is that the one of the ways that we honor the creator of these beautifully, wonderfully made vessels of ours, which the more I learn from you, quite frankly, Dr. LaFay, on this Elite Healthcare series, the more it inspires me to worship and, and really uh, give God the glory for the way that we are so beautifully, brilliantly designed, that there's got to be a creator of that to, to think of all of this and to have it functioning in our involuntary responses. And so for me to understand and open my mind, because the Life by Randy community is a community that does have an open mind to learn and to be open to new concepts and new and new information, hopefully processed in a way that is understandable and relatable. And so that's the goal. And so assuming we are this open-minded group, uh, what would you share about meditation and what your thoughts are as why it gets, quote, like a, a bad rap, kind of like our cholesterol discussion. There are things that have made their way into our culture and where we shun it or we have an immediate judgment or reaction to it. And yet it, it's so beneficial for us. What are your thoughts? 
Um, first of all, I think in our culture, it, it's hard to, to tackle this topic and not get it at least a little bit philosophical. And I do think it's uh, specifically culture driven that it, it's sort of weird here, right? We don't grow up being still. We do just the opposite. We worship speed and production and we're judgmental of our coworkers and our family members who are not contributing enough. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's the exact opposite in our culture. So then to to suggest that someone can make progress actually by slowing down, mm. that's a really tough concept for people to get their brains around. Yeah. Um, so getting into it physiologically, the the I'll use a, an example of a marathon runner, um, a mom marathon runner who is uh, also a, a, uh, in the workforce and runs for stress relief and um, trains for marathons because she's a type A and an ultra, ultra, you know, motivated personality can, you know, knock off a to-do list like nobody's business um, and comes to me because she's tired. She can't lose five pounds and she is quick to anger with her children. So that's a really common scenario. Maybe not all the details, but very, very common patient. And, um, you know, especially the bit about losing your temper and not being able to, to, um, lose weight. And if you're running 10 miles a day, why could you not lose that last five pounds? That makes no sense. You know, eat less, move more. That's how you lose weight. Right. Well, physiologically, if you are always in that fight or flight mode, going back to how I said we could talk about stress in every show, if you're always in fight or flight, whether it's from a memory or an active schedule, that your body is on the go, it's moving. So now let's say you're you're literally running, not literally, figuratively running on the inside all the time. The opposite of that, the parasympathetic system is rest and digest. So even though you're getting, let's say eight hours of sleep at night, you're not able to rest during that time. And why can you not lose weight? You can't digest your food. You cannot digest your food when you're actively running away from a tiger constantly. So, and there's not really an off button on that, um, sympathetic or constant fight or flight state, you have to engage the parasympathetic, which is the opposite in order to calm this down. You can't just flip a switch. So how do you engage the parasympathetic? The most simple way is to activate the diaphragm, deep breathing. That's why you start to see breathing in all of the meditation, you know, sitting still kind of being able to calm your brain very, very often it starts with breath, right? So, um, I forgot your original question, to be honest, but <laughs> no, you, 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 you answered it, but let's go to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems while they, while you know exactly what they are, uh, I'm not so sure we all do. So what is the sympathetic? It's called the sympathetic system. Yep. First. So two parts of your innate nervous system really is what I'm describing. One, the sympathetic is that's go, that's, you know, run from a tiger, get your to-do list done. Um, you know, I'm about to run a race, the surges of energy that you feel that's your fight or flight. Most people are familiar with that term. Parasympathetic is just the opposite. That's, um, down-regulating everything except for up-regulating things like digestive enzymes and uh, neurotransmitters that you need to get good rest, maybe like dopamine and, and those types of things. So there's, um, there's the, the, you want them to have an, a nice balance, right? And you want to largely live in sort of this easygoing rest and digest phase until you need to go and then you want to be able to have that capacity to go. We very much have the opposite in our culture where we largely live in the sympathetic or live on the go juice. I call it internal Red Bull. <laughs> and, and rarely, sometimes if ever, spend time in the parasympathetic. So that's why you, you see clusters of symptoms. It often starts with, you know, not being able to sleep very well. Um, then, you know, that turns into fatigue, which those can be, you know, present, present as so many different disease 
you know, predecessors or, or the symptoms of so many different types of disease processes, just those kind of nebulous symptoms alone. And then, um, you know, daily headaches will be a common complaint, all kinds of digestion issues, because it's really tough for that system to be efficient when you never really allow it to be. So bloating, uh, feeling full really <laughs> easily, um, either having a really, um, uh, frustrating insulin sugar balance where you're hungry all the time, or kind of not really having much of an appetite. There's some extremes that can develop there. Um, you know, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, all those types and labels of IBS or irritable bowel sy syndrome. Um, those are all typically stress or somehow related to your, your brain and your moods. These are, they're related to the cascade of hormones or chemicals that are produced in the brain as a result of stressful thoughts? Am I oversimplifying? I'm trying to understand it in the most practical sense. That is a really uh, well said statement. That's one component of IBS very typically is you've been having stressful thoughts even or a stressful lifestyle or both um, for so long that you really can't digest efficiently and it starts to manifest as constipation for some people, diarrhea for others. <clears throat> and then once you start to break down the, you know, the components of your digestive tract, like your, your digestive juices aren't as potent, your cell barriers aren't as, you know, tight, then that starts to affect your, your brain on the opposite end and, and the chemical cascade it's, it's sharing with that. So, um, that's a really nice statement that you said it, it they're, there can definitely be much more to it, but again, visit our talk on, on the liver and GI and digestion for our talks rather, um, for some more details with that, but yes, right. they're very related to your gut, your gut and your brain are very related. So let's say you get full really easily. How is that a sign of stress? And that is your parasympathetic nervous system not functioning the way it should? Sure. Um, when you're digesting well, your gut has a natural motility to it. It's called peristalsis and it kind of does this nice like rocking, squeezing kind of motion. And when you can't ever get to a point where you're having this nice digestion phase, then that peristalsis can, can almost come to a, a point of paralysis. So um, you can imagine if things aren't moving along like they should, that um, you would feel more full quicker. Um, another thing that gives you that bloated sort of full feeling is when um, we've talked about before, when, when the acid bath of your stomach isn't very potent, then it really is not, you know, it, it can churn all at once, but it's not really breaking down that food very well. So, you know, it has to stuff all that stuff, uh, all the food th par particles then through uh, a sphincter to get out into the um, small intestine. And if, if those particles are pretty large because you're eating at your desk and not chewing your food very well, and then they're not being broken down very well by acid, you know, they're not going to get through very readily. So, so you are so right. Everything goes back to stress and the microbiome, right? The living organisms that are those tiny organisms that are so powerful. And that is our episode number two is about the microbiome and gut health. Oh, Dr. Lafay, this is so fascinating. And it all goes back to thoughts, thoughts and perceptions, right, of our uh, external reality and how we are taking in information, how we are perceiving the information, how we're processing the information, whether we're reacting or, or responding in healthy ways or unhealthy ways. Absolutely. So getting back to our topic of meditation or mindfulness, prayer, slowing your brain down. If you can start your day, for instance, with some time where you're, you're getting centered, you're, you're slowing down, you're, you're having focus, and then you go about the same exact busy day that you, that you would have, that you had scheduled and you would have done whether you did that or not you're approaching that same exact busy day with a different chemistry and a different ability or lens to um, focus on that day. So uh, anyone who 
anyone who is still routinely can tell you that when they get out of the habit, they feel a, a, a difference. Mm-hmm. And most people in our culture <laughs> never really get that true feeling of relaxation because it takes a little bit of practice and it's not, it's not going to happen unless you try for it. Right. And when, when we start, but let's talk about mindfulness versus meditation before we get into meditation versus prayer. And when I say versus, they're not antithetical, but they are a little bit different. So let's go through kind of your, your definitions of how you view this and how you work with your patients. So I tend to call most things mindfulness to be less intimidating (laughs) in conversation with patients, but there is a huge difference there. Mindfulness, I think is more applicable throughout the day. Like, um, again, you come upon a situation, you can label it bad really quickly, or you can say, okay, you know, here we are, this is our current reality. I'm going to, you know, ask for guidance and just kind of move forward because this is what, what we're dealing with here, good or bad. Um, that's mindfulness. It's a, it's a way of, of thinking constantly, consistently in my, by my definition, Meditation is when I am trying to be still and really do nothing active with my brain, focus on my breath. Maybe if I need to focus on a guide, uh, a guided voice, like, you know, um, a bunny hopping through the forest or some kind of imagery if I, if I need to, or want to that day. Um, but really the goal is to, um, turn off all the active channels in my brain so that I can just let it rest. And then um, prayer to me is um, where I'm really talking to my Lord, my creator, and um, sometimes, you know, incorporating scripture and really meditating on, on the word. And that's where I'm starting to blend those concepts because I often won't go into meditation before I pray because that helps me settle in. I, I want to, um, you know, come at it from a place of spirituality and positive positivity, and I want to feel protected, you know? So, um, so these are shades of gray that we're discussing, but I'm, I'm with you. I used to think that they were mutually exclusive and in fact, just the opposite, you know, if you're. If you're Catholic, you may think that you you may have been taught and and genuinely think that things like yoga and um, meditation are are too Eastern for, you know, they're a separate religion when in in fact you could call the rosary a meditation. Um, And it is it's a it's a meditative prayer. So there, you know, we kind of throw these words around, but they are what you make them. Mm -hmm. Great point. It's about intention. So much of life is intention. And intention is a form of prayer in and of itself as if you're intending. Uh, It comes from a heart uh, centered approach and what your heart in sync with your brain and your thoughts are doing. And so we infuse everything with intention. So if you approach meditation with the intention, uh, with, with whatever intention suits you, then that's what it becomes. Very important. We've got the power to do that. Absolutely. And I, I brought up that you, food can be the same way, you know, in, in one of our previous episodes, I was talking about that you, if you eat a piece of healthy food, but you're doing it distracted and you're not, you know, doing it with intention, then it can create a different chemical pathway in your body. than if you sat down and thanked and blessed your food and then, and consumed it, water is the same way your thoughts around a situation. You know, if you're doing the dishes and you're grumbling the whole time, then that completely changes your chemistry and your day and your outlook. If you take those same dishes and you decide that you're going to put on some, um, music that makes you smile and you're dancing around the kitchen and thinking, you know, Hey, I'm really serving my family here gladly. You know, someone else's job is to do a different chore and, and I may have to harp on them later a little bit, but they'll get that done. And, you know, it's a totally different experience for you mentally and for you chemically. And there are so many studies on that. And I had become fascinated by that when I started going down this road back in 2012. 
of learning something more and beginning with Dr. Joe Dispenza's book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One, uh, changed my life, literally changed my life and the concepts and principles in here. And I do have a, uh, we're studying the book on Life by Randy in a series as well. If anyone wants to join that, and I refer you to Life by Randy on YouTube, also on Rumble for those short clips, breaking down the book the best I can in quantum physics and kind of understandable ways because it is so powerful. Let's revisit the fact to the point that you were able to beat cancer with this. You know, this is not child's play that we're talking about. Thank you for bringing that up. And that is, that is my story and why I'm on YouTube and Rumble in the first place. And in the second place, why I'm a patient of yours, Dr. LaFay, in my recovery. But yes, a miraculous story. And if you're not familiar with it, more details are at lifebyrandy.com. Uh, just very quickly for if someone is watching this for the first time, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer towards the end of 2020. And within five months, without chemo, radiation, and surgery. They didn't take the tumor out. They didn't give me a mastectomy. They, I, they gave me palliative care only, which according to the Cleveland Clinic was an estrogen inhibitor. And within five months, a PET scan showed, several PET scans showed, the tumor was gone and all the cancer had left my bones. It left a wake of destruction in my bones and my blood and my energy. And that's where Dr. LaFay has come in to help me uh, amp up my body in such an amazing way. And I've never felt better at, uh, here at uh, March of 2023. But when I was diagnosed, uh, but for the first couple of days, when I didn't think that I had the strength to beat this, my husband said, if you don't think you have the strength, you're not going to, because I really felt like I was dying. My organs were shutting sick. down and my blood, I was sick. Yeah. And all these broken ribs. So I went into to meditation with the uh, protocols, if you will, of Dr. Joe Dispenza's. And there's the HEAL documentary on Amazon and I think on Netflix too, that showcases exactly what I did. It could have been me on the HEAL documentary. And I rehearsed daily what it would feel like to get that cancer-free diagnosis, found the frequency of joy and acted as if it had already happened. I did not consent to the cancer ravaging my body and I put myself with my thoughts in a different place. And I had joy for so many wonderful people that would come over and deliver meals. And they're like, you're smiling all the time. But I'm, I'm in joy. It was miraculous. But yet, what is the miraculous? How can we effectuate the miraculous in our lives? I believe, and it's what I did, is through that power of meditation, finding that frequency and acting as if it's already happened. And therefore, it manifests in your life. Is that, is that a, a good assessment of meditation or that kind of powerful medical meditation? I think you're better qualified to explain it than <laughs> I've been through it. And, and I, I said this before, I'll repeat it. If I had heard your story five years ago, I would not have been able to believe it. You know, my, my scientific brain, my heart would have wanted to believe it because obviously I don't think you're a liar, but my brain would have gotten in the way. And it's only because I've always been inquisitive and worked so hard to keep an open mind. And I actually, I don't have to work hard to keep an open mind. I have to work hard to keep an no ego. I think, don't we all? <laughs> and, right. And right. Yes. yes. In medicine, really, and just maintain an openness where, um, you know, I, I'm, I can incorporate different ideas and use them for healing for patients. And I don't have a story like yours personally, but I'm able to believe yours now. And I'm able to um, grasp this concept enough that I can bring it up to my patients, which is a really big Beautiful. deal not even having something as severe as cancer, there are, are situations all the time where people are sitting in my office with chronic illness they've been dealing with. And until you go back and, and do some, some of this work, sometimes you will never feel your best health. I mean, I've watched it over and over clinically. Wow. And what I did also is speak to my cells and made friends with my tumor. And a woman that works with me, uh, Stacy Newman of Sweet Energies, and I'll put her link below, 
is a, an intuitive energy medicine practitioner. And she's worked with me for many, many years. And she encouraged me to face the cancer right away at the beginning, uh, being open, loving, and curious, naming the tumor and asking what it wants to teach me. And so I moved into this spiritual space in accordance with my faith. And there were very well-intentioned friends and acquaintances that I had some acquaintances that were gently and sometimes not gently correcting me that it was a work of God. And we can do both. It's God and us and the divinity of ourselves as well. So that's why I call it on my website is co-creating with the divine because we are divine beings. And so we can access the divinity within and the divinity outside of us. And because we are one. And so we do have that power. That's where, that's where I've landed. And that's how I moved through this. And I wanted a dramatic story of five months. I didn't want it one or two years. And so that's what I got. And so I'm grateful. And I say this without any ego. I'm certainly grateful. And there are times where I can't believe it, but I've got the PET scans and all the blood work to, to prove it if I, I need to remind myself that this, this really happened. I think that was a beautiful description. Um, we were touching on this earlier. It's, it's always been my history personally. And I think a lot of patients that, that, that meditation and spirituality um, and religion are mutually exclusive. And I, I have come to really realize that they are not mutually exclusive at all. Getting to a point where I can be still and and quiet my brain, um, which I will reiterate, take some practice. When you first sit down, this is my story. I set my phone timer for two minutes, trying to start meditation one day. And in that two minutes, I looked at that timer eight times and I thought way more <laughs> all the things I had to do that day and what, what I could be doing instead of sitting still then I did. And then, you know, I didn't get my brain, what I would call down for, gosh, months really consistently, you know, I'd have little glimpses of it, but it, it took some work. And, um, so I tell people start with shorter times, start with guided things, you know, don't make the mistakes I made. <laughs> um, and I have lots of tips and tools for how to, how to even just start exploring things that might work for you. Um, but my, my bigger point is I am a religious person. I have faith and I, I do believe that we are divine. We have divine within us. We have a divine creator, and it's a lot easier to have that discernment that we always pray for. It's a lot easier to hear the voice of God when you are still and when your brain is not clogged up with all the little ticky tasks that you have to do. Yes, yes. I mean, I was able to sit down the other day and it, I had my Bible in front of me. Again, this is, this is my personal story. This may not resonate for everyone, but I had my Bible in front of me and I was really wrestling with a specific thing. And I was able to say out loud while I'm praying to myself, I, you know, could I please see the scripture I need to see? And do you know, I opened up right to a passage that spoke just to the problem I was having. And, you know, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Well, and so for for those that don't come from that ilk, you could you could move into meditation without having to kind of plow through those concepts that might keep you from it. Um, so moving into meditation and what it actually does, from a medical perspective, and I know there are many studies on this, and we'll I'll look for some and, and link them below as well, on the physiological changes that occur when you still your mind, when you quiet your mind. And so the benefits start with the thoughts and the engaging that parasympathetic nervous system, right? Yeah, which we hear about the breath work. And so that's not just something that happens in a yoga studio or on mountains in, in Tibet, right? It actually has all everything to do with 
the diaphragm and how it begins to calm our nervous system down. Could you speak to what what that is? Because I, I know for me, and I, I'm then sure for a lot of my viewers, once you know the why of something and the how, it's so much easier to do and you embrace it and it can be easier, uh, much uh, more readily accessible to you and you you do it more because you know why and how. Yeah, yeah. I I would encourage anyone watching this video now when you're done, just sit still and take some deep breaths. B- breathe in really deep, fill your lungs up as far as you can. S- you know, sit there for a couple of seconds and then exhale just as slowly and exhale everything out of your lungs as far as you can and just do that like 3 times and see how you feel after those three breaths, you will palpably feel more calm because it stimulates, it moves your diaphragm, which is a a visceral muscle that lies between your chest cavity that houses your heart and your lungs and is protected by your ribs. And then the the contents of your abdominal cavity, liver, um, all, all of your abdominal organs. So that muscle moves up and down when you breathe and there's a a fat nerve that runs through there called the vagus nerve. And it has a lot to do with stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system. It gets triggered when you're moving Mm -hmm. that diaphragm in a very slow rhythmic way. And that sets off your parasympathetic nervous system, which just kind of counteracts that sympathetic enough that you feel a difference. And so often we breathe in such a shallow way. We're not used to our culture is so fast paced and we don't breathe. I think we take in just enough to keep us surviving, but never indulging ourselves with the breath. Right. And that vagus nerve is so very important to, um, to our parasympathetic nervous system. In fact, it might be the 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 key factor in calming it down isn't that isn't yes. the vagus the vagus nerve can we go into a little um bit about that vagus nerve it's big i mean you talk about respecting your your body and how beautifully it's made it when you see things in an anatomy class which i had the privilege to do as a medical student you, i cannot fathom how someone can walk away from that class and not know that, that we were made intentionally because the design and the backup plan and the backup to the backup plan. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And I remember the, the, one of the first times I saw the Vegas nerve, I was like, that is a fat boy. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And, um, it, it's, it has a a big job, you know, it, it affects most of your organs of digestion, um, and really is, is what's triggering all of the, when you trigger that nerve, it starts to trigger all of the neurotransmitters that are calming for you. So then all of a sudden your, your brain is taking a bath in, in dopamine and things that are very calming as opposed to the cortisone, cortisol and adrenaline that we're used to running on. When you're making those stress hormones all the time, you are chewing through nutrients that you need at a much faster rate. So there's really typical stress patterns we'll see in in people's micronutrient panels that involve like um, some B vitamins being lower, often calcium and magnesium, um, uh, often lithium, uh, you know, I could, I could kind of go on, but my point there is D is another big one. Um, but my point there is then that your requirements of those things become higher, right? And then you need to consume more food in order to feed those um, building blocks. And if you, if you're not really, you know, making good food choices because you're stressed out all the time, you know, you just see that feed forward negative cascade. So, so beginning with the breath work, we'll call it breath work. It's just breathing. Yeah. Breathing yeah. deeply, filling up the lungs. Otherwise, I was like belly breathing, filling up, right? Having your your abdomen rise and fill with the air, ensuring that you're getting as much air as possible. You're stimulating that vagus nerve, the, the biggest uh, nerve in your body that's so crucial to this. So that vagus nerve then gets stimulated when you through the diaphragm when you're using the diaphragm for this deep breathing and then that 
the vagus nerve being stimulated triggers these neurotransmitters that go to the brain. And I love how you said it. Your brain takes a bath in these beautiful chemicals that actually work to physiologically calm us down. So that's the science of this, of the, of the breathing. Okay. Beautiful. What about when we start to meditate and, or when we just stop our thoughts? So if we don't even want to call it meditation, but when we stop our thoughts and we go into this, Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it the being nowhere and no one just being neutral, if you will, just neutral without a thought, which is so difficult. And once you start, you, right? Sometimes it's hard to not have a thought for 15 seconds. Every three seconds, we want to keep thinking, and then we'll have an itch. And then we'll think, oh my gosh, I need to unload the dishwasher. When I first started meditating, I would do that. And I'd get up and unload the dishwasher. And I would, I, my body just didn't want to sit. Yeah. Yes. But oh, then yeah. with practice, you don't live without it. You you don't want to live without it because of all the beautiful benefits of realigning, of really being centered and you're centering prayer or you're uh, uh, being grounded. So what else does meditation do? Help with digestion or how, so that we can start to digest the foods and make those nutrients available yeah. is, is absolutely those same neurotransmitters that calm the brain promote digestion so you know that triggering parasympathetics um we can include a chart here of what the parasympathetic nervous system does okay. and sympathetic nervous system does and and just know that you want you know sort of this balance between the two and that ours are, tend to be out of balance um this is what I say about meditation, it's the simplest, hardest thing to do, right? Yes. It, at its core, all you're asking yourself to do is sit down and, and, and not think, Okay, <laughs> you know, and, and I will often hear people say, well, I get my relaxation in front of the TV or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I get my relaxation by exercise. So here's, here's what I need to, to, to say to that crowd. Um, those are beautiful ways to release tension. When you're watching TV, yes, you're not really having any thoughts, but it's bringing you to a frequency that's lower than where meditation brings you to a frequency that's much higher. And at this lower frequency, you're actually more susceptible to um, other people's uh, um, mm. thoughts and ideas. So that's why advertising, for instance, is so um effective while you're watching TV. Cause you sort of get into this numbed out zone. That's this frequency. And then you're more, you're more, um, what's the word I'm looking for. You're just impressionable. Impressionable. Thank you. That's exactly the word I was trying to search for. You're more impressionable. Um, and then when you're exercising, you actually are stimulating stress hormones, even though you're relieving muscle tension at the same time. So mm -hmm. there is some, I should say when you're intensely exercising, because, um, you know, oftentimes I'm hearing that people are getting stress relief from exercise when they are out running uh, th uh, three miles really hard or something like that. If you're doing some rhythmic walking, you can get into a pattern where you're, um, you know, able to get in, in some calm, but there is no uh, greater benefit when you're talking about the, the mindfulness space than being still and asking your brain to be still mm -hmm. and working toward that goal. Uh, one is a book called Unplug and the author is Schwartz. There's a subtitle that I don't want to butcher. It has uh, a picture of someone sitting cross-legged with a, a plug kind of coming out and in, into a socket that's not there. And it's a book a friend gave me when I was at the very beginning of exploring this. And it's so uh, simple. Like it's the first time I read any kind of sort of self-help categorized book that I felt like, hey, I can do this. She mm -hmm. really breaks down the science in a beautiful way that I think is very attainable to the lay person in about the first, it's first of all, it's a really quick, simple read. She really does that in about the first third of the book. It's not protracted. It's, it's her story and, and a little bit of the science behind it, kind of the stuff I'm getting at. I think she does a good job of laying it out like breakfast. And then the middle third 
which if this is the only part you read will, will really be helpful, talks about how to do it and how to, um, you know, refocus your brain when you have those squirrel thoughts that we keep <laughs> alluding to, yep. you know, I got to get up and do the dishwasher or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, she, she talks about how just notice that notice that you're thinking and you're supposed to be focusing on this and just refocus, you know, don't judge yourself for that and, you know, let it go and just refocus and do that as many times as you need to. And she talks about different things, like how you, you don't have to be totally still. You can, you don't have to close your eyes. You know, all the things that immediately were like breaking all these ideas of what I thought meditation was. So, um, and then mm. the last third of the book, she gets into some things that definitely don't resonate with everyone. She talks about crystals and some other things, and you certainly wouldn't have to read that at all if you picked it up. I I think it's a really good place to start if you're curious after this conversation for some really basic how tos or. Um, if they're, if they're ready for a, a more of a, a advanced class, I think joining your study would be fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. If you're ready to dive into Dr. Joe Dispenza and the quantum physics of it and his own story where he thought his way out of being a uh, quadriplegic after a uh, bicycling accident, very, very powerful, very, very inspiring. And, uh, goes through the, the the science of it from the brain and such a powerful way. So Dr. LaFay, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. I think that it might be deserving of a mindfulness meditation part two on going through more of the how to's, what it's like and the different options that is that are available. What do you think? I think that would really serve, serve people. Well, I know when I first started it again, it's a very, very simple concept, but you feel all thumbs because it is just such a foreign thing in our culture. It's a tool to enhance your life. And certainly from this episode, enhance the physicality of these beautiful bodies that we have. Absolutely. I would, I would kind of leave by saying you can have very profound effects on your health and your life. Even if you describe your life as very happy, it, it, it's just such a, a central part of our health, mind, body, spirit, right? This is the yeah. spirit and the mind that we're talking about. The last thing I'll say is trying to convince someone to slow down enough to do this. I can, I can describe it by Somehow, even though you're taking time out of your day to perform um, sitting still, it adds time to your day in essence, because you are so much clearer and more calm approaching things that um, you're more efficient and multitasking becomes easier and you can discern what needs to be done. So there's, there's time for it. Well, I think allow our beautiful viewers to digest this information and then we'll do a part two to dive in more to the specifics wonderful. thank you so much dr lafay until next time and real soon <laughs>